but because um, they really do go hand in hand. The God's preservation and God's providence really do. Oh, I got to turn off my screen. Those <laughs> captions for Sunday, so automatically goes to that. Um, but. Uh, and so God's work in providence, we start out with this kind of definition of it. It's that continuous agency of God by which he makes all the events of the physical and moral universe fulfill the original design with which he created them. Um, and so it's a preserving act. We talked a little bit about preservation, but it, you know, like I say, it kind of fits in here. Um, he is working, you know, he's got an original design of the world. Evil stepped in, evil's marred it. Um, I, I love, as a kid growing up, there was this gentleman in our district in Michigan who was a chalk artist. Maybe you've seen one of these because, you know, people go around doing this all the time. And he'd draw this beautiful picture and then he would talk about sin and he would take that piece of black chalk and then just put this like mark right down the middle of his beautiful picture as every, you know, uh, elementary age kid just gasps, right? And then he would turn that into something beautiful. Hmm. Because that's what God's doing in the world. And in this act of providence, He is working to fulfill that original design with which He created the world around us, us and, and, and as human beings. So it's a, it's a preserving act. It's a powerful act. It's the power of God working to do this. It's not something you can do. It's not something I can do. It's not something anybody else can do. It's only of God. It's a personal act. All right, God as a person is involved directly, not indirectly, by laws alone. And it's a purposeful act. This means that no ultimate harm can come to God's children and no accidents can befall them. Now, we talked about this in God, in the divine origin, or the divine orders of God, the divine decrees of God, that, that one. God can use the negative and the bad. So yeah, you, you, we go out of here, and sometimes it's we're, we're going to talk, we're going to have a series um, starting in two weeks on called Keep Hope in Mind. It's going to be sort of mental health, but not, uh, we did a mental health a couple years ago where like we talked, preached on anxiety, preached on depression. This is going to be more on the topics, uh, more a little bit higher in, and so um, one of them were, were um, through a passage from Paul, we're looking at things such as in our brains, how we frame things, right? You know, we, we frame them as negative. Um, it's raining outside. Oh, horrible. This is, you know, what a bad day. You know, you look out, it's Northeast Ohio, it's gray every single day. You know, and you, you get this negativity. I had to drive to work this morning all two blocks from my house in snow and slush, and yet we can look at it from the other side and reframe it and go, man, it might have been a little slick, but those those snowflakes this morning, I don't know about where you guys are at, but those snowflakes were huge. And, and, and Jefferson, while the trees drive me nuts during the fall, right, when all the leaves have fallen, and when they're in my yard and they plant a new one and it seems to be a whole lot further out of my property, now i got to mow around it. You know, no, instead of reframing it and going, man, those red leaves in the fall lining the road on both sides or the snowy, ice-covered trees are just beautiful, right? We can, we can see things in the negative. Or we can see, you know, it's the fender bender accident and now your car is totaled and now it, woe is me or, man, I'm so thankful nobody was hurt. You know, how we get to do it. And so this is what that means. It doesn't mean that as believers, no harm will ever fall, you know, fall on you. But that the ultimate harm, that anything that, as if God did not control it, that God, you know, can't use it, that God can't continue to work through it. That's what that's talking about. Um, nothing outside of God's knowledge, no accident outside of Him can ever fall on us. And so as we look at that in the contrast, we see that, you know, we've got creation. Creation has to do with the commencement of things, the beginning of things. It's not just at the beginning. Remember, God is doing little acts of creation. When a, when a seed in its miraculous way turns into that what will become the oak tree, you know, germination or whatever that term is, because I didn't pay attention to certain parts of school. You know, but, uh, uh, you know that uh, God is doing synthesization, right, or whatever it is where, you know, God is allowing the leaves to take the sun and turn it into nourishment, right? 
uh, you know, those type of things, that's creation taking place. At conception, when a new spirit is born into a child in the womb, that's creation taking place. There's preservation that has to do with the continuation of things, right? We've talked about that. There's that providence that has to do with that consummation of all things. You know, providence is looking towards that end. Providence is that looking to fulfill it back to the original design. We have been transformed and redeemed as believers. The kingdom of God is here, but it's a now, and there's a term in theology, it's really difficult, it's called now and not yet. It's taking place now, but it will be fulfilled, not yet. We are being transformed into God's likeness now, but man, when we get to heaven, that likeness of God is going to be amazing. We have the capacity to sin now. In heaven, there will be no capacity to sin. We will be completely made new. We have been made new now by the Holy Spirit. We will be made even more made new in heaven at the end of all days. That's that work of providence. Preservation is between now and then. Providence is looking to the then at the end of all. Um, Prevision is kind of that foreseeing. You know, is it cognitive or causative, right? That was that whole conversation. Um, and then provision is the foreseeing in order to care for something. That goes in that divine orders. That goes into uh, the divine decrees that we talked about as well uh, a few weeks ago. Um, this biblical defense uh, of divine providence. And, and throughout the Word of God, we see that God's providence is taking place in the universe at large. The universe at large, God's Providence, his hand of providence is in it. Psalms 103, God rules over all. You know, that's a, on our morning devotionals, we've been going through prophecy and we're in Revelation. And, um, you know, the historic Christian belief, and we're not, we're not going to get into Revelation in a bunch here, but so often we go to Revelations when the world's falling apart uh, in, the, in the Christian church. We, the world's falling apart, and so we want answers to when God's coming. And so we go to Revelations. And yet, Revelation was written to the first century church to give them hope in the midst of their trial and persecution. And so we read it, have to read it first like that, and then begin to see some of those things that are talking about the second advent of Christ. You know, because we read it without understanding certain other passages. So Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 9 give that picture of the Son of Man that John then gives the same picture, you know, in Revelation of the Son of Man. And, and we see these saints are connecting back and forth about how God is ruling everything. And, and when we see revelations that, and we say, well, the kingdom of God is something that's in the future, instead of realizing that that prophecy of Daniel of those empires, and the Roman Empire was the last one, and that stone would come that would break all world empires, set up its kingdom, the kingdom of God, to which there would be no end. But we're not living waiting for the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ established it. The Holy Spirit was the testimony of that. And we live in victory. Satan has been defeated. The, his power is half of what it used to be. You know, he, uh, I like to say he's an animal in his death throes. But we give him more power. We act as if, if we're not careful, in an extreme dispensationalism, we want to say that the evil is compounding and it's worse now than it's ever been. Well, tell that to the German church when Hitler was in place, right? Tell that to, you know, and just keep going back generation after generation. It's naive of us to assume that the world is the worst it's ever been now. Now, does it feel like it sometimes? Yes. That was why I was late getting in here because the dad was talking to me about his fourth grader bringing home a book from the school library and it was all kinds of stuff that he did not want his fourth grader reading and luckily the fourth grader knew enough to bring it to them and he's like what do I do with this how, how do I get that pull off so some other kid doesn't read this and get have this agenda pushed into their mind right you know and so do you mind what was the book I don't know I don't remember the title uh, it was a kid's fourth grader book um, you know they're you know figuring out what to do it's one of those that you know you can just go to YouTube and you you see the parents trying to read it at the um, at the school board meetings and being kicked out because they're you know well that's you don't read that here that's perverse that's a, well that's what you're letting my fourth grader read you know it's that type of thing so and so we can very easily go but 
So God's not ruling. God's waiting. His hands are tied until that time. And yet the kingdom of God is here. God, Jesus Christ, is sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father, ruling, bringing all kingdoms underneath him. You know, Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 says, God works all things after the counsel of his own will. He's ruling after this universe. In that appendix, God often uses means to carry out his program. Decisions of people and prayers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we could just look at, you know, World War II is probably one of the one of the things that is still known to us, or even 9-11. Uh, 9-11, well, that's even better known, right? 9-11, um, we lived through it. And yet that was at least where we were in all churches were saying, so church growth that year after 9-11, mm -hmm. it was something like 40 or 35% more people were going to church that next year. It was probably the last time that we have had something that drew people into the church. I don't think we've ever COVID to do that. No. You know, we've not seen people turn to God like they did after 9-11. Was it one of the most horrific things that we've experienced in our lifetime? Somewhat, yeah. But yet God was able to use that. He was able to use it. What's sad about it is this is how long did it last? Six months? Mm -hmm. A year? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and For some yeah. I just think that it's that's that's the way humans are. God in the middle of the crisis and then mm -hmm. completely forget about them. And the importance of discipleship, that growth, right? Because if not it becomes a hell and fire hell, hell insurance, fire insurance. So um, yeah, I'm say I hate to say it, but I think it's what it is for most people. Yeah. I know it's judging, but it just seems like that when you, you know. Sure. Yeah, they, they, say, they say the words, I believe in Jesus, mm -hmm. and then it ends right there. Yeah. 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 Um, the next one in that biblical defense is the physical world. Physical world around us. We see Matthew 5, 45, that God sends rain and sunshine on the just and unjust. You know, we... That, that whole passage, right, you know, that's talking about, and, and we see that even in our lives, right? We, we hate to see the, um, well, I won't even say names. We could go throughout history and pull out people and go, they are the most sinister, backstabbing, horrible, evil people, and yet their company is here. Or, you know, um, not yet Elon Musk, I like him, but, you know, but, but they're unjust, and yet they're successful in that way. And... God says, I send rain and sunshine on the just and unjust because his judgment comes later. You know, you could use the same example when it comes to somebody who's seemingly gotten away from murder. I, I, I want to say I've seen, and I got off of all of the news and all of that stuff, but at one time, like one month, I think there was probably 15 murder mysteries, cold cases from 50, 60, and 70 years ago that were solved by DNA. You know, that for, for that long, people were like, God, are you just going to let them get away with it? And yet the judgment did finally come. You know, um, ultimately, we know there's a judgment at the end if they haven't accepted Christ. Uh, but yet, God allows that rain and sunshine to fall the just and unjust light. Sometimes we hate that. <laughs> you know, we, we really do hate that. You know, Matthew 6.30, God clothes the grass of the field. You know, he cares for it. He takes care of it. Um, we see this in the animal kingdom as well. And so, um, you know, kind of in, in the notes of that, I, I just wrote this, that, you know, all creation is good, but all creation felt the effects of sin and darkness. Thus, all creation will experience that redemption, not just humanity. Again, we sometimes in our humanistic way that has come in the last couple hundred years in thought process since the great enlightenment and all of that, this putting of our thought process, you know, my absolute truth is not yours, so therefore, you know, we put me over everything, we begin to then go, well, 
That final redemption is only for us. But yet, final redemption was all creation. You know, it's going to be heaven on earth. We're going to see the mountains shine. We're going to see, you know, trees that are more green than we've ever experienced. God's redemption will be for to remove the mar of sin on every created being. Now, does that mean that your pastor is a recycling Nazi? Curtain? Um, no. You know, I drive a truck. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not electric. Um, I can't afford electric, you know. But there are those that would take that and go to that far extreme of, you know, going into, you know, really caring for creation. We should. Uh, we should care when we see strip mining taking place and ruining the, the earth around us. But, yeah. You know? But, you know, God's defense of the animal kingdom. And so God feeds the young lions, it says. Um, and Psalms 104 is one of the examples that it gives there. Um, and God feeds the birds of the air. Um, that great song, His Eye is on the Sparrow. In Matthew 10, 29, God knows about even one sparrow falling to the ground. He cares for all of creation. Um, you know, I, it's very rare. There are a couple artists out there who have gone to that extreme. They painted Jesus looking like Snow White. You know, all the birds flocked to him and stuff. And I, don't, I think that's hyperbole, but you know, or just bull. You know, it just it's not right. You know, but yet God cared enough for all of creation that redemption will come for all. Um, and that's why the lion and the lamb will lay down together. They will be back to that original state before death and chaos. I've heard people say, oh, animals, dogs, your dogs, your cats, they're not going to be in heaven. I'm like, oh, really? Um, no animals, huh? Jesus is supposed to come back on a horse, if I'm correct? Dogs, yes, but not cats. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you love cats. No, no cats. Right. And no pineapples for you, right? That's right. <laughs> pineapples and coconuts will be destroyed with the effects of sin. Uh, Actually, no, my taste buds will be corrected. And there you go. Right, right, right. At that time. Right. You will appreciate that much. Better. That's right. You know, <laughs> the texture or whatever it is. But, um, then the next one we see is providence in the affairs of nations, right? That God, Psalms 22, God governs the nations. He is governing them. Acts 17, 26, God appoints the times and the bounds of their habitation. They can only go so far. Which even more goes back to that Daniel prophecy that the kingdom of God, there would be no overarching world empire ever after that the Roman Empire finally died off. You said it's in the book of Daniel? Yep, Daniel 7. The, Thank you. The statue. It's, uh, yep. Um, and so it, it goes through and it describes and um, it describes the different ones that would take place. Daniel was at the head with Babylon, and then you would see the Greeks, and the, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, um, and then the Roman Empire, and it describes each one. And then the last is a stone that rolls them away. Um, John in Revelation describes the same statue, per se, but from a different angle, because he's looking from the future backwards. <laughs> it's that Rome is already kind of dying, so he's looking back from Rome to Babylon. Daniel is looking, he's in Babylon, and Daniel's looking Babylon forward. Gotcha. Um, so it's pretty neat. Same thing with the beasts. Because the beasts were describing the same thing. And, and Daniel has the beasts, and he's looking at this order. John is the same beast in a different order, looking backwards. So um, it's very unique when you look at it like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, man's birth and lot in life is another thing with God's providence. Yeah. I always, as a child, you know, would sit and ponder. Um, I remember one time going, why was I born in America and not India? Why? You know, why am I who I am? Why was I born to the parents that I had? Why would, you know, we, we wonder that. Well, it's because God's providence designed that. He designed our birth and lot in life. Um, God made David king in place of Saul. In 1 Samuel 16. He determined that lot. 
God knew Jeremiah before he formed him in the womb. He had already appointed him for a ministry. God separated Paul for a ministry from the womb of his mother, Galatians 1, 15 to 16. Even though Paul went a different route, right? You know, Paul was the Jew of all Jews. He was studying with the high priests themselves. He was, he was probably on the fast track to be the next high priest. You know, that was his training. And yet, God had ordained his life. And guided him and directed him into being the, uh, the writer of half and three quarters of the New Testament. Um, so in that appendix, the important thing is not how a life begins, but how it ends. How our life ends. Um, you know, it can begin anywhere. It can begin in, uh, in the poorest of poor homes. And yet it's how it ends that is the most important for God. Um, you know, he, he, his providence is over the outward successes and failures in people's lives. Um, and that's kind of an interesting one to think about when it comes to free will as well. You know, he's over those outward successes and failures in our lives. And I wonder sometimes, I've seen people, well, we could just look at pastors throughout, um, big name pastors. And, you know, I, I am not one, I, I do not like pulling out names, but, um, you know, Rabbi Zacharias had an amazing ministry, and after his death, it wasn't just an accusation, but hundreds came forward yeah. that there was stuff going on. God allowed the ministry aspect to succeed even though he had these depths of failures. And then you have others who, I mean, their ministries are torn from them in the midst of a failure. You know, and you, you wonder why. Why was that one allowed to go so far? I mean, it is his world reaching. Um, you know, but that's part of that providence. God will put down one and puts up another. He allows one to be president and another one to be vice or, <laughs> or not get elected because Russia stole it. I, you know, I mean, he's the one who orders some of that. God puts down princes and exalts those of low degree. I mean, Joseph, right? He, he's, he's stuck in a prison. He is a slave who gets accused and he's stuck in a prison and yet God exalts him to the second in the kingdom of Egypt. Um, why? God seemingly accidental and insignificant things in life. Some seemingly accidental and insignificant things in life. You know, God determines the way the lot will fall. Now, does that mean go out and play the Powerball when it gets big because you got God on your No. no. <laughs> um, don't do that. Um, you know, but God determines the way. God has numbered the very hairs of our heads. And I can make a joke that for some of us, it's a lot easier than others, but... Um, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of very hard. Careful, yeah. <laughs> Careful right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got two boxes. So, yeah. when, when I candidated for this church, I was told I didn't fit in because the last two, the last pastor and the last two associate pastors they had were all shaved head bald. I mean, they were just bald as could be. And they're like, you got hair. But now they didn't like coffee, and I did. So that I think was the uh, the thing that got me elected or yeah. brought in. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, God's numbered that. You know, He He knows, He knows. Um, and so an illustration on that. I, I, in, in your book, I have this illustration on a couple of these. So you know, 1930s. Um, I'm just talking about accidental and significant things. 1930s, Joseph Stalin ordered the removal of all Bibles and all believers in. Stravopol, Russia, right? Uh, Christians were sent to the dreaded Russian uh, prisons for their Bibles, and their Bibles were taken and locked away in a warehouse outside the city. In 1994, a team of missionaries went to that city when it became difficult to get Bibles. Someone mentioned the warehouse full of Bibles. Request was made to the government officials to see if they would open the warehouse and allow the security of the Bibles for the townspeople. And surprisingly, the request was granted. The missionary team arrived the next day with a truck and several Russian men to help load the Bibles. 
One of the men was a very young agnostic who agreed to help only for a day's wage offer. And as they loaded the Bibles, one of the missionaries noticed the young man had disappeared. They found him in a corner of the warehouse weeping. He had slipped away to steal a Bible for himself, and what he found changed his life. Inside the Bible he had stolen was the handwritten signature of his grandmother. Out of the thousands of Bibles locked away in that huge warehouse, he had found his own grandmother's Bible. A coincidence? No. <laughs> but only more results of the operation of God's providential hand. Can I stop you for a second? Yeah. I'm going to tell you something that happened. You know, they, say, they say miracles don't happen. Okay. Well, bold. Okay. Um, Dr. Stan wrote a book, uh, The Source Within My Strength. Mm -hmm. And back in 2011, when my first wife and I split, uh, I wrote them an email and they sent me that book in two CDs. Well, I needed Lake Jen driving around and because uh, my ex took the car and uh, all of a sudden that book disappeared. Well, a year and a half later, my mom's dead for, she died in 97, this is in like 2013. Mm -hmm. I go into this recipe shoebox, my mom's recipes, and they're down this far into it. This is that book. Yeah. And I had not been in that box. Yeah. Okay, so it just, it was like, you know, mom just gave me that. So, yeah, these, these things, things happen, like, like that. Yeah. Thing. That's we awesome. Just, we just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're just blind to it sometimes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then God, God protects the righteous. We see these verses, you know, that God protects the righteous while they're sleeping, Psalms 4 tells us. Um, and God delivers the righteous from the snares of the fowler and the deadly pestilence in Psalms 91. Romans 8 says God continues working all things together for good for those loving Him. Right? We already kind of quoted that one tonight. And so we see those different things. And then, you know, another illustration kind of on this, you know, one winter night, an unexpected sound woke the household at 3 a.m. The dad dashed down the hall, sniffing the air. When he came back upstairs, he was puzzled, finding nothing. A few minutes later, the mother, mother suddenly cried out, the coffee pot. I think I left the coffee pot on at the church. Earlier that evening, she had served coffee at the church gathering. The dad immediately left to check the church. Ten minutes later, he returned, let out a sigh of relief, and said the pot was on, burned empty, and beginning to smoke. And what, a half hour earlier, had woken the family? The smoke alarm in their own smoke-free house, right? You know, just those sayings that God, if we're listening, puts those things into our head to you know, steer us where He wants us to go sometimes. Um, you know, that divine providence, we see the supply of the needs of God's people. You know, Philippians uh, 4, 19, God supplies every need according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. When believers pray for what they think are needs and these prayers are not answered, it might be that God does not recognize or request his needs. Because sometimes what I say I need isn't really, it's, what I used to tell my kids all the time, right? There's a difference between want and needs. <laughs> you know, it, it was a want that I had. I, I, I want a Cobra Mach 1 1971 Mustang Fastback. I, I want all Mach parts, you know, but I don't need that. In fact, I don't need to pay the insurance on that. <laughs> Or the bill, if I were to try to pay for it monthly, you know, I don't need that. It's and so sometimes we do. We pray to God for our needs instead of or our wants instead of our needs. Um, and that arrangement, and that divine providence, the arrangement of answers to prayer that He does. Matthew six eight, God knows our needs before we ask. Matthew six thirty two, God knows our needs before we ask. Matthew six thirty three, God adds all things temporarily needed to those who continue seeking first his reign and his righteousness in their lives. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. In that providence we see the exposure and the punishment of the wicked. 2 Peter 2.9 tells us God preserves the unjust or righteous unto the day of judgment. Like we said, it may not happen in this lifetime. They might escape man's judgment. But God's judgment can't be escaped. Revelation 20, 11 through 15, God has the book of life in which are recorded the names of all the saved. And 
even the control and the free actions of mankind, uh, we see that God can control those. And so we see that through some general acts, Exodus 12, and um, we'll kind of skim through some of these, but uh, these are all different ones that, uh, uh, that spotlight divine sovereignty, and so they must be balanced with that free will. But Exodus 12, 36, the Egyptians gave the Israelites what they asked for. You know, the 12 plagues had come, and God had already said, and remember the covenant, he goes, hey, there's going to come a point, they're going to beg you to leave this land, and even more, they're going to pay you to leave this land. And they did, they gave them all sorts of riches. Um, Ephesians 2.10, God prepared beforehand that his saints would walk in good works. Philippians 2.13, God continues working in the saints to be willing and to be doing of his good pleasure. Um, there's a declaration, right? And then in 2.12, there was the demand. We, we talked about some of those where we see these declarations that God is doing a work, but we also must do a work as well. Um, James 4, 13 to 16, the saints do things, but only God is, uh, only if God is willing. You know, he sometimes controls equal acts. There's that uh, Exodus 7, 3, and like I said, there was an addendum, we talked about this a little bit, the harden of Pharaoh's heart. Only after he had hardened his own heart. So Pharaoh had hardened it, and God just kept on. Um, Joshua 11, 20, God hardened the hearts of the people in the cities of Canaan to come against Joshua. You know, he, he poked their pride, right? You know, he instigated it and, you know, put a little bug in their ear. Oh, you can defeat them. And it brought them out against uh, the nation. Um, you know, the Canaanite sinlessness uh, in the time of Abraham was not yet ripe for judgment. We see that all throughout. You know, that's one thing, too, if you ever have somebody come to you and they're like, well, the Old Testament, all it is is, you know, God just killing a bunch of people. And it was genocide. And so if you look, there was always a list of names. The Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the, you know, Jebusites, and a bunch of other termites, you know. And, and that whole list of individuals, and there was a reasoning. They all came. And there's genealogies for a reason. They all came from Esau, who rejected, who knew and rejected, and also from, um, you know, like Ishmael. Those two things, those two, two lines were these groups, and most of them were from Esau, that God said, they have rejected me so much, so far. They knew. And so when that judgment is ready, it will be poured out. But even then, they were never annihilated. They were kicked out of the land. They were pushed off. They were pushed out. They were told not to be allowed to be around. And, um, you know, and so it's a complete misunderstanding of the Old Testament and the revelation of God to go, well, there is an Old Testament God who is all about murder and a New Testament God who is all about love. Um, and we miss that in, in Scripture if we're not careful. Um, 2 Samuel uh, 16, God told a man to curse David. Um, you know, 2 Samuel 24, God moved David to number the people and then punished him for doing it. And there are a couple times like that that are kind of interesting because you can hear God's testing of going, okay, David, are you relying on me or are you relying on your numbers? And he goes, so, hey, it's your choice. What do you think you want to do? Uh, you want to see how big your numbers are? And then David does. And he goes, okay, since you don't trust me, and he sends a plague on that, in that passage. He sends a plague, and it kills off, uh, you know, 150,000 warriors. And David's army got smaller. Kind of reminds you of Gideon, right? Gideon goes with all of his men. He goes, I can handle this. And God goes, uh-uh. Nope. And he dwindles it down. And Gideon still going, well, I, I can do this. I can do this. And he goes, uh-uh. And he dwindles it down so small. And he goes, I'm doing that because if I hadn't, you would have said, you got it, you did it, and you get the glory. And instead, only I can get the glory. Um, you know, that's God. He wants the glory. We can't steal his glory and his worship. Uh, Romans eleven thirty two. God shuts up uh, unto disobedience, and um, shuts all up unto disobedience in order that he may have mercy on all. Um, in the appendix, such providential oversight does not mean that mankind is to blame for the evil things that they do. God's providence relative to evil acts is seen in some of the following ways. And my print seems to be getting smaller and smaller. I don't know what happened. At least on the screen there, it's bigger. Um, you know, he can be seen in the prevention of evil. You know, 
there are times where he holds it back. Genesis 20, God forbid in Abimelech from touching Sarah and sinning. Um, Genesis 31, he warned Laban in, in a dream to take care regarding how he treated Jacob. Right? Matthew 2, God protected the little children, Jesus, um, a child Jesus, by warning the Magi. Matthew 2, 13, God warned Joseph and Mary. Um, we see that over and over where, where Satan was Satan was prime. You could put in there too. So, you know, Satan, think about it this way. Satan didn't know who the Messiah would be. He didn't know. That's why he goes after Moses. You know, and you could go throughout history of the different ones that he attacked and went after. He tried to kill, thinking, well, if it's Moses, let's kill all the, the babies. And well, Moses gets through. And maybe it's him and he's attacking him. Well, Moses wasn't the Messiah. And he's following after him until Jesus Christ. And then, oh, in his arrogance, he thinks he's won. He's on the cross. He's dying. He's dead. He's having a victory party. And then, <laughs> you know, um, even in those evil acts, God is, God's providence can be seen. Um, you know, that permitting of evil, uh, that God permitted Pharaoh to harden his heart and rebel against doing the Lord's will relative to Israel. Um, Romans 1, God gave the people over to moral uncleanliness. Um, the reprobate mind. We see the presiding over evil so that good comes from it. Genesis 50, 20, God presided over all the evils Joseph suffered in order to bring great good for Israel out of them. Um, it was a mosaic, not a mess. Um, man, tapestry. Yeah. yeah, he was building the story. And that's that, you know, we can't see the million piece puzzle that God's putting together. We see our 42 pieces in front of us, you know. Um, we have a hard enough time putting that one together. Yeah. Acts 4, God presided over the evils connected with the cross of Christ that his counsel might be carried out. Romans 8, 28, God presides over all things to continue working them for good for those who are loving him. And there's a prescribing then of the bounds of evil and its effect. Job 1, 2, you know, there are certain things God told Satan he could do. Job 2, 6, God told Satan he couldn't touch the body, but you know, he could touch the body then, but not the life. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, God tells us that He will not allow us to be tested beyond what we are able to endure successfully with His strength. That's one we always forget about, right? Right. So, not in my own power, but with His power. When we're giving it to Him, then we can over, overcome it. But Revelation 20, God says that in the end times, He will curb Satan's uh, deceiving of the nations for a period of time. Um, and there's that divine uh, division in the providence some of the divisions that he has well first you know god's unconditional his unconditional providence exists relative to some of the following so again kind of talk about some of these the physical universe there's an unconditional providence that he has in the physical universe that he has over the animal world that he is pro providing for the natural world the rain the lightning the sunshine the snow seasons as much as we hate them think about it, even in our spirituality and our walks with grief there are seasons that we go through and that's a natural thing um, then god has this conditional providence it's conditioned upon our doing the following loving them we're called to love god when we steal his worship steal his praise we're not loving Him. That's the covenant that we're in with Him. He calls us to love. He calls us to obey. <laughs> to obey Him. That was the Israelites. That was the covenant. If you love and trust and obey me, all these great things are going to happen. And they did great for a few hours. You know, Moses goes on the mountaintop. Remember, the nation of Israel was invited to go up and be in God's presence, and they were scared of the mountain. And so they said, no, Moses, you go up. And then Moses is having a party with God, and he's up there for like 30, 40 days. And so they think, well, maybe Moses is dead. Now the mountain's still there, the cloud's still there, the thunder's still there, but maybe Moses is dead, so hey, Aaron, build us a God. <laughs> signs of the covenant were there. The signs of God's provision. And this is the people who had the pillar of cloud by day to lead them and a 
column of fire at night. Right? You know, the part we miss about the Red Sea is that they get to the Red Sea, they're all jammed up, and Pharaoh's coming, and God takes that fire and puts it in between the Egyptians and the Israelites, Scripture tells us, and holds it off long enough for all million or so people to walk across on dry land to the other side. And they've already forgotten. God goes, if you would just love and obey me. Not even love. And we said this before. Yeah. The crisis, and then all of a sudden it's, it's over, so we just completely yeah. put them aside. Yeah. Just, That's exactly it. So we love, we obey, and we abide. Abiding in Christ is His words, abide in us. Sitting in His presence. Meditating. I mean, there's been times certain denominations have made that a negative word because we've associated with Eastern medicine, you know, meditation where you clear your mind of all things. But this is meditating. It's it's a chewing. That the Hebrew word is hagar. Hagar was supposed to sound. It was. It sounded like a lion chewing on its meat. That's what we're called to do with God's word: to meditate on it, to chew it. To, to let it ruminate in us. You know, be still and know that I am God. Okay, great, I read my verse for today. No, it's, it's thinking about it all day long. Be. Be still. Be still and know. To know what? That I am. I am God. It, be still and know my trouble's going to get away. No, no, no. Be, be still and know I'll make it through. No, be still and know I am God. Be still and know that I'm going to win out in the end and people are going to see that I'm smart and intelligent. No, no, no. Be still and know that I am God. <laughs> Man, you know, we abide in Him and let His words abide in us. Then we pray. Praying for help with thanksgiving. You know, there's so many different acronyms. There's SOAP. There's ACTS. There's, you know, if, if, if you ever need help praying, there's so many different mental things to help. You know, ACTS was one I always grew up with. It's adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then supplication, your needs or the needs of others. You know, that's ACTS. Um, couldn't tell you the SOAP method anymore. I, you know, there's all these different things to help us pray. Um, that's even maybe something we've lost in the Protestant faith because... The prayer books, they were a form of helping us learn to pray. In early tradition, the Psalms were read as prayers. They were to help give words to our... You know, what does is, what is a theology class do, right? It, it, it gives you words to your thoughts. It helps you frame the thought. And, and so that was the use. Not that we pray someone else's prayer to get away with praying our own thoughts, but you begin to learn. When, when you read, um, Charles de Farquaad had a prayer, um, deliver me Jesus. Deliver me Jesus from the fear of being overlooked, for being unseen, for not being sought out like I want. And, you know, and then eventually it's, make me more humble like your servant Jesus Christ. I mean, and, and so you learn how to put words to your thoughts and your emotions through the Psalms, through those prayers that have come before. And sometimes we just we walked away from the common prayer. We don't realize that even a lot of Protestant churches for generations used it. But we reached a point where like, I don't know what You know, the rosary was not a negative thing. The, the rosary was a numerical thing that it became something when it wasn't, but it was supposed to be a tool to help you learn to and to do so for a period of time so you're sitting in God's presence listening to Him. Then it got connected with the priest absolving you of sins. And so go, go say five Hail Marys and three Our Fathers and you'll be good. You know, that wasn't what it was intended to do. It was to be a prayer tool to help you usher into God's presence. Um, then we learn to trust Him. Trusting in Him more. Preserving in prayer, you could say at all times, that just says at times, but practicing the presence of God. That appendix, uh, then it's just, you know, every one of these conditions emphasize an activity that continues. The Greek word in Scripture was a continuing. That's why these all have I-N-Gs on the end. It's that present tense, constant, ongoing, that we are always to be loving, obeying, abiding, praying, trusting, preserving. It's not a once and done. Um, 
Oh, we're almost out of time. We're almost done. Look at that. So some difficulties with divine providence, or with this providence. Um, what the doctrine of providence does not mean. It does not mean that Christians have the explanation for all happenings in life, because they do not. Katrina was not a punishment on the people of Louisiana for their voodoo beliefs. Right? That's easy to say that. And maybe it slightly is. <laughs> but we can't use that as an excuse. Providence of God, it was, it was a storm. <laughs> it does not mean that all events are understandable to Christians. Because they're not. They're not. We have a family in the church. He's the younger sibling of like six. And in the last... See, I did his, the first funeral for his sister maybe 12 months ago. Not even that. And he's lost four siblings and two um, in-laws. You know, uh, like the brother-in-law, sister-in-laws of his siblings. Just in that short matter of time. Um, you know, it's not all understandable. You know, we can go, well... You know, chin up. God's doing a good work through you. He's going to work something out in this. You know, it's not, all the events in life aren't understandable. We don't know why they happen. We don't. The Bible isn't just a horoscope to tell us the news and, you know, the shootings that are taking place. Well, look, oh, this is not, it's not meant for that. It does not mean that Christians will never have to suffer. As one person wrote, the extreme greatness of Christianity lies in the fact that it does not seek a supernatural remedy for suffering, but a supernatural use for it. And God can be seen even in the depths of our society, even in those dark moments. I think I learned that the best sitting next to, and I forget her name now, her husband Everything seemed normal, and one day her husband walked into the Nickel Creek Amish School in Pennsylvania, held the kids captive, and murdered them, and then shot himself. She ended up, years later, writing a book, because there's, there's been movies even made on it, because the Amish community that day came over to her house, and the bishop stood in her living room and said, we do not hold this against you. We've forgiven your husband for what he did to us. And she wrote a book of her coming to know Christ through their love. Even through the depth of the suffering, God had a supernatural use for it. Her book was never a New York Times bestseller, but I can tell, uh, I know numerous people, on like even a church we were at, we got her to speak there when she was at my store for a book signing, and, and God used it. God used it to strengthen individuals. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that Christians will have a trouble-free life. In this world, you will have troubles. <laughs> but take heart. I've overcome. There's a supernatural going on. It doesn't mean that Christians are just pessimists or fatalists. The world, oh, is, I mean, it, it's, it's really easy to say, we know we're living in the end time. God's coming. But that's not a pessimist view. It's not a fatalist view that, well, the world is getting so bad we can't do anything about it. I love the verse in Revelations. It, it talks about the one qualification of, actually, no, I'm sorry, this is in Jesus, Matthew 24, in the Olivet Discourse. And he's talking about all these other things, and he goes, as for the end times, Man doesn't know the day or the hour. Neither does the Son of Man. He goes, but I can tell you what will usher in. He goes, the entire world will, be, will hear the gospel and then the end will come. That's the only thing Jesus had to say about the end times. Nothing about an antichrist. Nothing about thousand years, this, thousand. All he had said was, nobody knows. Don't worry about the day and hour. All you need to do is worry about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ so that all the world hears. Um, we shouldn't be pessimists knowing that the end is coming. Uh, 
What it does mean is that Christians have a personal trust and a personal God who loves them and continues to work all things together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28. So I love this little, you know, all good theology comes from peanuts, but boy, look at it, Ray. What if it floods the whole world? It'll never do that, Linus says. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. Which Linus goes, sound theology has a way of doing that. <laughs> Takes a great load off of our mind knowing that God is ordering. God is preserving. God is, is providentially caring for us. Even in those tough moments, that He is leading us and directing us. That's the importance of good theology. A good understanding of who God is. He's not a Christian horoscope. He's not going to give you the answers to the Powerball so you can be a billionaire, even though you promised to give a tithe. You know what? No, he's, he's going to work out in those tough times, in, in those moments where, like Hudson Taylor, we're so weak we can't pray. We're so weak that we don't even want to read God's Word. We just learn to just lean into His arms, to lay out full on into His arms, carrying us like a child, right? Um, that's what good theology does.